was born and raised and still works in Tempe. And if you want a few screenwriting tips or some behind the scenes shark was gossip, now is your chance. But before we do that, ladies and gentlemen, we do have some housekeeping things we need to make sure. Please, no vaping in the room. Yes. Yeah. It's a, a law. And nobody along the walls, although we aren't that crowded yet. And if you have questions, we have a microphone if you want to go up there. If you're not feeling sure that you're going to be loud, but if you want a small room, small group, you can just raise your hand when that's time. And if you have a phone, please turn it off, or we will probably make you go butt work with the Umbrella Corporation as front line. Thank you. Mike. All right, thank you for coming out. Just a couple things. I was dumb and forgot my power cord, so I've been told that my battery will run out if I turn it on now, so I'm going to wait a little bit before I turn on my PowerPoint. The other thing is, on the questions, the, there's going to be a Q&A section at the end, hopefully, um, if we get to that. The first three people that ask a legitimate question, not a movie question, um, a legitimate movie question, um, are going to be put in a raffle um, for a book that I had a story in, Kaiju Rising. Um, there's also a couple other authors here today, so we'll get signed. So, first three people get a raffle, one of you will get this book for people who ask questions. Um, let me see here. So, yeah, thanks so much for coming out. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Thanks so much for coming out. I know there's, there's a ton of really cool stuff out here. Um, it's going on at this moment, right now. So the fact that you're here today tells me that you all have very poor judgment and life skills, um, which means you're perfect for screenwriting. <laughs> so really quick, show of hands, how many people planning to write a screenplay, writing a screenplay, just were just interested in it, just interested in it? Great, okay. So today I'm gonna sling some advice at your face um, about screenwriting, and I'm going to first give you some advice about taking advice. Um, it's just an opinion. But I'm going to say, if I say something that you find useful, that you like, that sounds true to you, use it. If I say something that does not sound true or useful or won't help you out, don't use it. Simple as that. Um, if you're passionate about doing it a different way than I recommend, please do it your way. I don't want you to go against your passions. But the only thing I do ask, if you do decide to ignore someone's advice, myself or any other writers, Please ignore it for a good reason. Okay, don't ignore advice because you don't want to rewrite your first act or because it will force you to examine your work more closely. Okay? If you're passionate, it's a great, a great time to ignore advice, advice. But if it's because you don't want to do the work, eh, not so great. So that's my advice on advice. Let me get the PowerPoint going. A couple things we're going to do today. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown. I actually didn't know we were going to have a monitor, so I'm very happy that he was here today. Um, I'm going to do a quick rundown on who I am, for those of you who don't know. And then I'm going to go and give you just a really, really brief description of the man, the myth, the legend, Roger Corman, and just tell you a little bit about his work. Um, after that, I'm going to go over some, if I can find it and get it up here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go over some examples of feature structure versus what I'm going to call the sci-fi structure. Um, this is the cable movie structure. So you can kind of get, a, get a, an idea of the difference between the two structures of scripts. After that, I'm going to go over some style tips for the actual writing portion. And this is going to be especially true if you're writing a spec script, which all of us, if we're writing a script, and you don't have somebody that's paying you, that's a spec script, script. So, I'm going to give you some writing style tips. And then finally, after that, if this ever comes up, um, I'm going to do a little Q&A, as I mentioned. Um, if you have questions during the discussion, please try to hold them off to the end. I'm going to try to end with plenty of time to answer your questions. But if, if I run out of time, feel free to grab me outside the hall. We do have to get out of here a little bit quickly because I have another panel coming in. Um, but Feel free to grab me in the hall, in the comments, ask me questions. I love talking about movies, and you can email me, you can hit me up on Facebook. Um, basically, I'm a lonely, lonely man. I, I really want your attention. Um, and where did that go? I had two of them. Thank you. It's going wonderfully already. All right. All right, hey. And this 
That's what I just talked about right there. Okay. So, again, I'm Mike McClay. I was born and raised in Tempe. That's right. I've done all my writing here. I did not work in Hollywood, but my script's here in Tempe, Arizona. Um, I work as a teacher by day, high school teacher, screenwriter, and writer of comics at night. Um, I'm most famous for the movies that you see on the screen right there. Dino Crocs vs. Super Gator, Shark Ghost, Veronica, Attack of the 50-Foot Cheerleader, and Operation Road. Um, in addition to that, I am working with Brian Polito, as you mentioned, on several comic book creations. Um, actually, they were built from the screenplays that we wrote together. Um, and they include one, which is Zap the Zombie Exterminator. And then I'm also going to help Brian out on further issues of Lady Death, if anybody knows who Lady Death is. So I'm very, very just psyched to get to work in the comic book field, lifelong dream. Um, but you guys are here for movies. Oh, Brian, by the way, is in booth 7028. So really check out his stuff when, when you get a chance. Um, that's me. Roger Corman. Who is Roger Corman? Well, Roger Corman, for those of you who don't know, and so many other people might not know who he is, is the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world of B-movies. Um, Roger has likely directed and produced more movies than anyone in the world. That's not hyperbole. You just have to look at his IMDb page. It is ridiculous. Yeah, he started in the 1950s. He's pushing towards 90 years old now, and he still produces films. Okay. The original Piranha, uh, the original Little Shop of Horrors, the original Death Race 2000, those are all Roger Corman films. Um, but he is most famous for discovering new talent. Um, people like that. Martin Scorsese, Sylvester Stallone, um, Santa Bullock, Ron Howard with his directorial debut, um, Jonathan Demme, they all got their start working with Roger. Um, and for all, his, uh, for all his hard work in the film industry, in 2010, Roger was given an Academy Award, uh, Honorary Lifetime Academy Award, which is really cool because in the same year that he got an Academy Award, Sharktopus was released. So we have a man who has an Academy Award who released a movie called Sharktopus <laughs> about a mutant shark octopus that he's wearing in the And I, I just can't tell you how awesome I think that is. So. That's Roger Corman. Now, what did I learn from Roger? Well, I've learned lots of things, but the main thing that I learned from Roger is that there is a difference in structure between a feature film and a cable film, what I'm calling the sci-fi structure. Okay, this is the structure I learned from Roger. The difference has to do with, um, has to do with what you're willing to do to see the movie, basically. If you are going to see a feature film, a movie in a movie theater, you have looked it up online, you have driven to the mall, found a parking space, bought your ticket, got your popcorn, found your seat. Okay. You've put a lot of work into seeing that movie. So in that movie, if it has just a slightly slow time during the movie, you're not going to get up and walk out. You've invested You've invested time and energy to go and see that movie. On the other hand, if you are watching a cable movie or a movie that's streaming, you have not made that investment. You didn't have to drive to the mall, you didn't have to find your seat, you got the popcorn in the microwave. You didn't make that investment. If that movie slows down at all, you can change the channel. It's very easy to change the channel with a cable movie. And that's, that's a, a really big difference because what that means is that you have to keep the energy moving at a little different pace than a feature film. And you can't let those slow moments dictate your audience, um, their participation in a film. So um, to give you a little better explanation, I'm going to go through a really quick um, discussion about the feature film structure that some of you who have read screenwriting books you know already. Where did I learn about these? From these tools right here. Sid Field, read in college, like everybody else that studies screenplay, um, screenwriting. Save the Cat and The Secrets of Action Screenwriting are two books that I really wish I would have had. That I found these much later in my career. Very good nuts and bolts screenwriting books. Um, Save the Cat gets some bad press because it pushes formula. You could say it's formulaic. It is, but it's a great, 
And that's in Bolt's description. And most of the people that criticize it, I'm going to guess, probably haven't read it. They hear about it and they criticize it. But all good tools to, to learn screenplays. So, what did I learn from these books before working with Roger? Well, I learned the three act structure. Okay, anybody that's read a screenwriting book is a little familiar with this. Three act structure. Then the first act, about 10 to 15 minutes in, you have a moment called the catalyst or the inciting incident. That usually a problem that the main character faces that, that comes up that kind of disrupts their normal life. Okay? Then 25, 30 minutes in, depending on how long your film is, you have plot point one. Again, this is another problem that sets the hero on their quest. Okay? To either solve a problem, to achieve some goal, but it's about 25 to 30 minutes in. Um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Catalyst, 15 minutes in exactly, the government men tell Indiana Jones about the Nazis and the Ark. 15 minutes in exactly. 22 minutes in, he throws his pistol into the suitcase. He says, I'm going after the, the Ark. Okay, that would be your first plot point. By the way, really, let me take a quick step back. When I say minutes, minutes are interchangeable with pages. Okay? So one page of the script is supposed to represent one minute on screen. It does not. It does not really, it's not a good way to measure it, but it's the only one we have. So one script page equals one minute. So when I say minute, I might say pages, same thing. Okay, so 20, 25, 30 pages in, you got your plot point one. Now in the first half of the middle act, uh, it could be anywhere, but, excuse me, at 20 to 30 minutes in is your plot point. 25 to 30 minutes, again, depending on how long the film is, you have the introduction of something called the B story. Now your B story is going to run parallel to the main conflict. Oftentimes it's a love interest or just a friendship that happens. And again, it's going to run parallel to your main A story. Um, again, going back to Raiders, he meets up again with Marion. Um, 25 minutes in the script, exactly. Now, at the middle of the movie is the midpoint. Okay, and usually this involves a false victory. Okay, something bad, well, excuse me, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. It could be a, a false defeat as well, but usually it's a false victory. Something good happens. Andy opens up the Well of Souls exactly one hour into the movie. Now, that's actually not the midpoint for Raiders of the Lost Ark. If anybody watches, it's a little bit late, but it's exactly an hour and pretty close to the midpoint of the film. They open up the Lost Well of Souls. Second half, you have the plot point two, which is a break into the third act. Okay. Usually, this involves the lead character making some sort of decision to confront the antagonist. Okay. And the decision part is very important. Let me again take another step back to plot point one. It's very important that your protagonist makes a decision at the plot point to, to move into the next act. Okay, they can't be dragged into the next act. They have to decide to act. Otherwise, they're not a protagonist. They're not protagonist. Um, they're just being led along. So your protagonist is, is making a decision. Anybody that saw um, Fury Road? Who's the protagonist? It's not Max. It's Furiosa. Okay? She's the one that makes decisions. So, so I hate to tell you that, but that's, that's, she's the protagonist. All right, so the end act, the last act, the finale there, it's where the hero basically takes everything that he's learned throughout the script, throughout the movie, to help defeat the, the antagonist or to solve the problem to reach his goal. Okay? Now, how is this different than the cable structure? Well, the cable structure is essentially the same um, in terms of where the plot points fall. You need to shorten them a little because a cable film Sci-fi, for example, runs 88 minutes, okay? Does that mean you want to write an 88 page script? Please do not, okay? 95 to 105 pages, at least, okay? You want to give them some time to cut in your script, but the film itself is about 88 minutes, so all the plot points have to be condensed a little bit. In addition to that, they have what they call eight acts. They're not really acts. What they are are seven commercial breaks okay, for a cable film. And these are very important. I know it seems like they can break anywhere, but they're very important because in a cable movie, you have to break 
I mean action or a cliffhanger. So what that means is every seven to 10 to 12 minutes, somewhere in there, you have to have an action going on or a cliffhanger that's going to convince the viewer to come back. If you don't, if you end on that break where they're just talking, they're not coming back. Now, the first act appears about 20 minutes into the script, okay? 20 pages, the first act appears there. Now, if you're writing a script, you don't need to write act one. I just need you to be aware of it. You don't need to write end act one, end act two, or anything like that. But just for your own knowledge, 20 minutes is where they usually break to give the viewer time to get settled into the film. Okay? After that, it's every minimum seven minutes after that they break. Minimum. Maximum could be no maximum, but they want it evenly spaced. So again, you're looking at seven to ten minutes between the commercial breaks. Okay? And, and I can't stress that enough. Every time you have a commercial break, you need to have some sort of dramatic action or some sort of um, cliffhanger that's going to cause your viewer to come back. Now the final act can be less than seven minutes. Okay? It can be short. Now some some writers and some directors, they like to have this a, a resolution, a quiet resolution on this act. Oh, we killed the monster in the last act. Now we're, we're, we're kind of settling up together. Um, Roger is against that. From what I learned from him, once you kill the monster, the audience isn't as interested. Once the monster's dead, the audience isn't interested. Now, what does that have to do with you if you're writing a romantic comedy? It's the same thing. Once the girl gets the guy, the audience knows what's happened. They're not as interested anymore. Again, this is cable structure. So that, in a nutshell, is the cable structure of a film. Um, some of you may be thinking, well, what does this have to do with me if I'm writing a feature film? Well, again, like I mentioned, there are a lot more streaming opportunities out there now than there are theater opportunities. And we've all seen in the theaters that bigger and bigger and bigger budgets. Okay. These companies are not going to take your spec script and make a huge, big budget movie out of it. So you're better off writing a medium or lower budget film if you're interested in writing a spec script. Okay. So what that means is your movie would be seen on cable or on Netflix or on Amazon or some of the streamings. The same thing applies. Okay. If someone gets bored during that movie, there's another movie right after it on your queue already to go. They've made no investment of effort or time, and very little investment in cash. Okay. So you have to have that energy worked up a notch. All right, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is the writing style for scripts, for spec scripts. Does everybody know when I say spec script what I'm talking about? A spec script is a, a, a script you write when nobody is paying you. Okay? You're writing it and hoping of getting options or selling and then make a movie out of it, rather than someone paying you to write a movie. Um, the movies that I have had produced, I was paid to write those. Someone came to me with the idea and they said, here, make a script out of this. Okay? But I have written spec scripts and one of those short spec scripts that I wrote, while it didn't get produced, led to a better, another job, led to a screenwriting job. They took my spec script, they liked what I did, I used it as a resume, a portfolio. So even if the person doesn't like your movie idea, they might like your writing, they might like your ability, and you can use that as a resume to get other work. And so, now, spec script, now what did I call it that? It's so hard to say. Spec script writing style. Um, to give you an idea of this, I'm going to show you some examples of non spec scripts. The first one is Michael Mann, um, Miami Vice. This is the opening, and I'm going to read it for you. Exterior, ocean, close up, water, morning light. We are at the delicate interface between ocean and air, liquid and gas, the event horizon, where molecules evaporate. This interchange is ethereal. Then, low frequencies rumble depths louder, closer now, and the ocean surface is torn by a 46-foot catamaran and the roar of 2,700 horsepower rocking at 140 knots. Okay, so that's Michael Mann. Everybody know who Michael Mann is before you know him? Okay, good. Does that would make any sense. Michael Mann, very famous producer. Here's another one. I will not read this. Don't worry. Quentin Tarantino, 
before I, I say anything about Quentin Tarantino, I love his movies. I love Quentin Tarantino. But here's Django and Chain in the beginning. That is the beginning before one word of dialogue in Django and Chain. Okay. Here's the difference between you and these guys. You are writing for a much, much, much different audience. Okay? When Michael Mann or Tarantino writes a script, you have producers lined up to read it. They've made millions of dollars with their movies. They are going to read their scripts. Okay? When me or you write a script, you do not have producers who are going to read it. Okay? You have readers who are going to read it. Okay? And the difference is, readers, or even it could be a reader, it could be an assistant, it could be an intern that's going to read that script. Okay? So, those readers have a pile of scripts next to them that they have to get through. It's their job. They want to love your script. Because if they do, they're going to be the ones that found the next big cool script. But if you give them any reason to throw that script over their shoulder, they're going to do it. Because they have that pile of scripts next to them. Okay, so you have to be aware of that when you're writing the script. They're looking for an excuse to throw your script away. Okay? It's nothing personal. They don't hate you. They don't hate your dog. It's just their job, and they got a pile of them. Now, here's an example of a very successful spec script screened by Kevin Williamson. <laughs> Look at the difference between Scream and Django Unchained. Okay? This is not imposing whatsoever. I see Django Unchained, that's a wall of ink facing me. That's a wall between me and getting my job done. If I see this, this is not imposing. This draws me in. I'm going to read it really quick. On a ringing telephone, a hand reaches for it, bringing the receiver up. The face of Casey Becker, a young girl, no more than 16, a friendly face with innocent eyes. Casey, hello, man's voice from the phone. Hello, silence. That's it. That's the beginning of the film. Draws you in? Very simple. And you, you know the story behind the screen, there was a bidding war for this script. Okay. Different companies got into a bidding war to buy the spec script. Here's another spec script. Sorry, kids. It's American Pie from Adam Hertz. Okay. Interior, Jim's bedroom, night. Pan across the details of the bedroom. We see the spread shirts, pants, socks, and here, porno channel chick, voiceover. Oh, yeah. Oh, baby, you're so good. Jim, off screen. Yeah, baby, I'm the best. Look at the difference between this and Django Unchained. Okay. It draws you in. Clear, simple, to the point, but visual writing. Okay. That's what you need if you're writing a spec script. Very efficient, very clear writing. Now, we're going to break it down really quickly. If you notice, let me go back again to Scream. First of all, in Scream, the action, do you know what I mean by the action? The action is the paragraphs where you describe your characters and describe the action. Okay? Action, in this one, is three lines in a word. Okay? That's the action in that paragraph. American Pie, two lines is the first action. Okay? Your goal as a spec script writer is to get that action down to about four lines, max. Okay? Going back to my advice about advice, this is just my opinion. Okay? If you want to write more than that, and you're passionate about it, do it. But for a spec script, four lines for your action. And what that's going to do, even if you don't make four lines, let's give you five lines. It's not the end of the world. They're not going to throw your script away. But if you know that you have that limit, that's going to force you to try to write more efficiently. So, two lines, three lines in a word for screen. Now let's look at the dialogue. One word. Very short, one line for each line of dialogue. You want to try to get your dialogue into about three lines. Okay? When I say three lines, I, I just I have to assume that you guys know the, the formatting structure for a script or that you have a program that'll do it for you. Because I just we just don't have the time to go through all the, you know, where everything goes. Your, your script writing program will do it for you. Three lines is what your goal is. If you go over three lines, is it the end of the world? No, it isn't. But knowing that you don't want to go over three lines will force you to confront your, your script and make sure you're trying to write as efficiently as possible. Okay? 
And on top of that, we have to remember that dialogue means two, two people talking. If you have a huge, long monologue, one person talking, you don't get the chance to have that great, sharp, back and forth banter, okay? Dialogue is two, use it, it's verbal karate. Back and forth, conflict in the dialogue, three lines, sharp and quick. So, now that's the dialogue. The other thing I wanted to talk about, the other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of scripts are parentheticals. Okay. Parentheticals, if you don't know, these things right here, parentheticals. Okay. They come, in, in a play, they look like stage directions. Okay. This is not a play. This is a screenplay, very different. You don't put action in the parentheticals. Okay. You will see it, many examples of screenplays that will have action. So don't go home and say, he said you didn't put action, there's action all over this. From what I've learned, you're trying to avoid action. What those parentheticals are for are to clarify somebody's dialogue. So if I have three key characters talking, and I want to make sure the audience is talking to Bob and not Jim, I put to Jim in the parenthetical. That way the audience knows and the actor knows to turn to Jim. Now the other reason why I use parentheticals is to show how to deliver the line. Okay? Screamed, mumbled, shouted, whatever. You can put it in there to tell the actor how to deliver the line. Guess what? Actors hate it. Everything that I've heard, actors hate it, and they oftentimes, before they start reading the script, go through with a marker and just wipe those parentheticals out. So what that means for you is you're best off avoiding these as much as possible, okay? I'll give you a quick example from Piranaconda. I, I wrote Piranaconda and there's a scene where one character says, it's an unholy union before, between a piranha and an anaconda. And the other character says, you mean a piranaconda? And a third character says, I can't believe you just said that. Now, I put in the parentheticals that the actor was supposed to say that deadpan. Like, I can't believe you said that. Right? The actor that said it was a soap opera actor, and he handed up, I can't believe you said that. It was so much better than what I had put in the parentheticals. Okay? Let the actor do their job. You are to put the action in the dialogue, and they interpret it. Okay? That's their job. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about really briefly are camera angles. Okay? You are not a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. okay? You are a writer. Use your skills. Don't put, you know, pan, he zooms in on the guy's face and, and from a downward angle and the light shines in through the window. And that's not your job. Remember, three lines in the action that takes up too much space. And that's the job of the cinematographer. And guess what? They're not going to pay attention to it anyways. They have a lot more experience than you and me in, in turning those scenes into shots. So don't do it. And it slows down your script. So anytime you can avoid it. Now, of course, contradicting me, um, what did American Pie use? Pan. Okay? Camera shot. So never say never. If you can do it efficiently, that helps the reader along with what you're doing and sharpens your action. Okay, never say never but try to avoid it at all costs. Okay? The other thing, and they're very addicting, are the transitions. Now, I didn't get a chance to do any transitions. Anybody know what those are? Mm -hmm. Usually, at the end of the scene, they have a transition down here that'll say, cut to, dissolve to, fake to, okay? Try to avoid these like the plague. And the reason why I say that, you don't need them. Okay. In the American Pie, you have a slug line, the, the scene heading, right here. Interior of Jim's bedroom. It tells you right there it's a new scene. You don't need to write cut two. You don't need it. Plus, it's really dangerous to write cut two, because once you start putting cut two, it show up all over your script. Okay. So, give you an example. I was writing, I was, I was co-writing Dino Croc vs. Super Gator. I had a, a, a scene that took place between two helicopters. Guys had radios and they were talking to each other through the helicopters. 
I thought it would be a good idea between each helicopter to put a cut two to make it clear you're shifting from one helicopter to the next. Okay? A scene that should have been a minute and a half okay, was five and a half pages. Okay? What does that mean? Okay, that means when they finish the film, the script was 100 pages long. This was my first big script that I ever wrote. The film was 100 pages long. They were short. When they were done filming, they didn't have 88 minutes. Why? Because I had too much words in my action, too many words in my action, and I used too many cut twos. Okay. Now, was it completely my fault? No. He's a veteran director, he should have saw it in the script. And they added scenes and it was fine. But, that's another danger. If you put that in there, your script could run short. Even if it's 100 pages and you're going for 88 pages. Okay. The main thing is, you don't need them. And once you start doing it, you find, I have one here, so I gotta put one here, and put one here, and put one here. So, you wanna try to avoid the cut twos. Um, oh, yes, really, very important. Characters. Let's go back to the screen by Kevin Williams. Characters, unless, it's important. Look at how he describes Casey Beckett. Now, everybody's seen this movie now. It's been last long. But <laughs> look how he describes her. A young girl, no more than 16, a friendly face with innocent eyes. Okay? In your script, unless it's important to the character, okay? if it's important, great. But unless it's important, don't worry about eye color, hair color, race. Don't worry about all those things. The casting director will take care of that. I saw when I was writing Piranaconda, I saw the villain as a white guy. I didn't put that in my script, but I saw him as a white guy. If they wanted to cast Samuel Jackson as a villain, I would have been thrilled. <laughs> but because once you put those things in there that subconsciously sometimes tells them, that's what you have to look for. Keep it open to them. Now, if it's important to the character, definitely. And you have to make that call. If, it's in, if their race is important, if their eye color, or hair color, or their fashion, is important, put it in there, definitely. But if it's not important to the character, if it doesn't illuminate who they are, don't include it. And you'll find more often than not, they don't. Now I'm gonna take a big step back and say a but to that. There's something else you wanna do, and this is something that Save the Cat, that screenplay writing book that I mentioned, suggests. Even though you don't wanna put those unnecessary details, include a limp and an eye patch. A limp and an eye patch. Well, what that means is give them, your characters, some sort of detail that you as the writer can call back to later in the script. Okay? So, for example, Casey, she has those innocent eyes. Now, if Casey lasted longer in the, in the script, if the writer um, had her later on, she can include, he can include a, a description of her innocent eyes. It's a callback. Why do you want to do that? Well, if you don't do that, all the characters in your reader's mind are going to kind of meld together. Okay? So it's very important that you, you keep, if you can add some sort of detail in there that just differentiates them from your other characters, be a little thing, then that's going to keep your reader from melding all your characters together in their mind and losing, losing the story in that. Okay? Dialogue too, we could spend we could spend days talking about dialogue, but your dialogue should illuminate the character. So every one of your characters should try to sound different. It's no easy way, there's no easy way to describe to do that. It's just practice. Come up with some catchphrases. I'm not saying everyone has to have a catchphrase or use a catchphrase, but use that to try to describe what that character's like in your own mind so you have an idea what their dialogue is like. So all the dialogue from each character, if they start sounding the same, they're gonna meld together in your reader's mind. So that's, and that's tough. That's just, that's just you on the seat, punching away on the, on the keyboard to get better at that. All right, so, so in closing on, the, on the, the tips there, again, sharp, efficient writing, cut out any unnecessaries, cut out any, anything that you can, they call it killing your darlings, adjectives, adverbs that you don't need, be efficient, and you're going to keep your, your readers' your readers tension more. Because um, remember, they have that pile of scripts, and you're going to lose them. 
If, if, if they get a little bored, they're going to move on, and this is their job. So that's that's pretty much what I have for you. I know the moderator ha might have some questions, and then we can bring <coughs> questions to the crowd. Well, does anybody have a question right now? Oh, wait, wait, before. Oh. Remember the first three questions? Oh, that's not. That's totally not fair. Um, uh. I didn't. I didn't think all the hands were up. Okay. Uh, Put your hands down. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, guys. <laughs> that was really not playing out very well. <laughs> Alright, everybody raise your hands. Who's, who's my body at? <laughs> that guy with the glasses. Sorry, guys. Book special. Do you have a, a, a good recommendation for a book on writing the sci fi structure way for cable movies that you could recommend? What people kind of don't realize, the structure for movies are all the same. Okay, the sci-fi structure is the same structure that I, that I just mentioned. Now, it's the details that go on. The structure, the backbone of stories, that's, that's written in our DNA. Um, people just will naturally fall into the structure. So, yeah, the, the Save the Cat, you can use that. Um, Save the Cat has another book out. I can't remember it. It's another book where they look at the, the different genres. And his argument is every movie fits into one of these genres. And if you look at the structure for similar movies, that'll, that'll uh, kind of tell you how to write your script. And that's a good writing, writing tip. If you're, if you're practicing, what you want to do is watch a movie in your genre. Pick 10 movies that you want to write about, like 10 movies in the same genre that you're writing. Okay? And then what you do is you watch those movies with a piece of paper and a pen in your hand. And, and man, I know this doesn't sound fun, but you just write down everything that happens. Every scene, you just write a quick little blurb about what just happened in that scene. And when it comes to something important, write down the time. Okay? And you will, you will realize the structure is going to fall through almost every story. Um, and that's definitely, that's the first thing that I would recommend if you are writing a script, Look for films that are similar, take a look at them, and deconstruct them, because that will help you so much with understanding the, the structure of that genre. Okay. I call him number one. Uh, all right, let's get somebody over here. And... All right, cool. Um, I've heard a couple different advices about writing specs, and one of the ones I've heard recently is when you want to write a spec, it'd be really interesting to write the most outrageous in terms of like the ideals, even if it might not be made, just to make you more of a common known name, especially if it's written well. Uh, there's one, I guess, that was written called Balls Out by Robotron 9000. Like the guy, the two guys didn't use their real name, they used that as a jumping off point. Yeah, I, I, that's a good point. Um, I think there's going to always be outliers. That, so you got to, I would never tell you don't write that, that giant script that you want to write. Don't write that huge script. But, but the truth of it is, even if they love your script, there is so much money involved in making those movies. They're going to go with someone, to make a big budget movie, they're going to go with someone that has some experience. Okay. Again, am I, I'm, am I the only person that's written spec scripts? Some other people are going to give you different advice. But I would say, you're better off writing a very creative, sharp, low budget or middle budget film. That's going to show off your writing talents. And you can put outrageous scenes in those, but try to put them in a lower budget. Because just quite frankly, they can't risk giving a newbie a big budget movie. There's just so many, so much money involved in and the corporations and everything. So but I don't know if that helps you, but and on the other hand, if you want to write that big script, do it, because the passion is going to make you finish the job. If you're not passionate about what you're writing, you know, I was thinking about writing a romantic comedy because I had a, a pretty good idea, and I was like, oh, this could really sell. I don't want to write that. I, I have nothing against romantic comedies, but it's just not me. Uh, I, I would hate writing it. So even though I think I could sell it, I don't want to write it. And, and, and that, that lack of passion that I would have would bleed through into the script. So the passion is very important. So if you want to write a big, huge sci-fi epic, go for it. But just understand, you know, you might be better off middle, low budget to, to get your foot in the door. Uh, uh, you have your hand up first. <laughs> is there anything you want to avoid in terms of 
uh, character or setting or anything if you're going for a certain budget? Like, uh, or like set pieces? Everybody talks about yeah. expensive set pieces. Very good question. If you're going, are you, if you're going for a lower budget, what to avoid? Um, every situation is different. Um, when I wrote Shark to Puss, they had the sets already. The, the, they had the areas where they wanted to film. Um, I'll give you a quick example. And early on, when I was writing, I didn't just I, didn't, I just didn't. You don't think about the budget. <laughs> This one? Yes. Okay. Excuse the gift wrapping. That's a light. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Friends. You can you can never go wrong. <laughs> Home Depot strikes again. This is for you. Oh, hey, look at that. From Grandma and Grandpa. Yay. Can I have my present after this one? I like that. Let me see if I can find a present for you. Where did you find that? Yeah, Ooh, Grandma. <laughs> Grandma. <laughs> can you get my present now? No, 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 no. That doesn't push that way. That's not how that works. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think really bright. I'm just opening a present. That's two million dollars. That's two million dollars. I know that seems nothing compared to these huge epics, 
But think about it, it's $2 million. That's a lot of money that they're risking on some guy from Tempe. So they gotta tell you what they want. So I don't know if that answers your question. I, I on a personal level, I, I just need a stable job. So I couldn't leave and go try to find, you know, work the system. If I was younger when it happened, I may have, maybe, but I don't think so. It's just, I don't think I would like LA. Yeah. That's nothing against LA, but it's just a different, different lifestyle and a different, you know, case. And it's more economically feasible to live here versus in LA. Yeah. Just to reiterate. Yeah, and, but I gotta say, I, I do think it's tough being a screenwriter in some place other than LA because you know, there's still a lot of jobs are made with a handshake um, and, and meeting at a, at a bar and meeting, it's, it's still how business is done and I'm not there. So other people are going to get the work that I'm going to get. Um, I met Brian here at Comic Con, Brian Toledo, who the creator of Lady Death and also a movie producer of The Graves. I just introduced myself. So that's how we started working because we were there. So I think that's still how business is done. So that's definitely a drawback to working in other places. And I think it's changing a little bit. Um, believe it or not, first two years I worked for Roger, never met the man. Hmm. All through the phone and internet. I didn't meet him until I started working on Shark Post. I mean, so that didn't meet him. So that, that might be the future. But for right now, it's, it is tough to work someplace other than LA. Thank you. Hmm? Yes? Um, since we're at Comic Con, since you brought up uh, the comics, how does uh, advice for a screenplay and how you do the screenplay, how does that compare to how you do the script for a comic? I mean, it's the same advice, same? It's, well, I mean, a story is a story in terms of structure. Um, I gotta tell you, I was shocked when I started writing these comics. I thought it was gonna be easy. <laughs> no, I, I really did. There is a totally, and I don't think I can articulate it well, but there's a totally different mentality that you have to have when you're writing writing a comic book, and you would say, and yeah, they're similar because they're both visual arts, but you have to narrow down every frame and have one emotion per frame in the comic books. And that's much harder to do than, than you realize. One action, one emotion, you really have to figure out what do I don't need. Um, you know, a minute, one page on a, on a movie script, it can be five comic book pages. And you can't do that, so you really have to know what to cut out and, and what, you what not to. And I'll be honest, I'm still learning. I just started writing comics a couple of years ago, um, and, and it was, it's really difficult, but it's, uh, it's so much fun. It is, it's really fun. Um, but yeah, it's, you have to have that mentality to be able to pick out, this is the most important um, image. This is the most important piece of dialogue, and you really got to be razor sharp with that. And my, my philosophy on, on, on that and my philosophy on the comics is just get out of the way and let the art help tell the story. I don't want to fill the panels with dialogue because and, and, that's not what comics are about. They're about movement and, and, and on the page, at least. So I, I, I try to keep the dialogue short, and that's, that's not necessarily easy to do. But yeah, they're, they're related, but man, it, there is a big difference. And, and I, was, I was really surprised to see how different it was. Script that took me, Brian could have probably wrote off in a, you know, a couple of days. It took me like a couple of weeks. Did you have a question? Yeah, uh, your problem with the uh, helicopters, and I'm thinking with the phone, you know, two people talking on a phone, mm -hmm. is the solution uh, person, you know, your, your action line, this house or this helicopter, pilot says, look out, other helicopter, intercut between the two, and then balance the dialogue between under the same action line? You know, there's, there's no rules, really. I mean, there, there's, there's basic things that, that screenwriting, this is what you gotta do, scene headings, and it's all always in, in present tense. And those are the rules, but other than that, putting the shots, there's not one way to do it. Um, I, what I could have done is just take out the cut twos and said chopper one and chopper two. Okay. Um, and cut it, you know, maybe describe it in the first couple frames and then cut it back to the people. Right. So there's not there's not really one way to do anything, and that's why it's hard um, when you give advice on screenwriting because then somebody else looks in another book and they tell you something totally different. Um, there's only just there's only just a few cemented you know rules to look for. Right. But that's well, a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've written a short, and you know, for me, I knew I was going to direct it, so I could put that all under one action line and not worry about wait, no, you really need to show. Yeah. Well, the, he brings up an important point. He said, I wrote a script and I knew I was going to direct it. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying, well, he can write whatever he wants, right? You can write it however he wants. 
But you have to remember, he has to get the money for that script. Yep. He has to send that to people that are going to have to read it to get money. So you can't write it however. You've got to convince actors to act in it for the yep. script. So you, if you're producing, writing and producing your own script, sure, it gives you some more freedom. But you really have to keep that in mind. Somebody's got to read this who's going to give you money. Somebody's got to read this that's going to invest their time in your project. So I, I would say that you know the, the same rules apply. Try to be efficient and sharp as possible. Um, and people are pretty savvy. I think they can. Yeah. I, th I, I one mistake I make is I don't give people enough credit sometimes, and I want to hit them over the head. This is here. This is here. I think it, people are more savvy than that in, in when they're reading your scripts. Yes. How, how did you get an agent? I do not. You did. I do not have an agent. The, the way that I started in my career is I, I fell ass backwards through screenwriting. And some of you might be looking at me with hate and disgust. Um, because that sounds like I got really lucky. And, and yes, I did. I did get lucky. But you make your luck. Okay? The way that I made my luck is I wrote for years and years and years, putting short stories out, putting on the web, putting on anthologies, whatever. I wrote for years. And I saw people that I saw as my peers getting book deals, getting, you know, things, and, and they're passing me by. So you got to put the time in. In that case, in my case, one of my short stories landed in the Best American Mystery Stories, which is a pretty, pretty well-known, prestigious um, anthology. I was in there with Elmore Leonard, who created the character for Justified, and James Lee Burke, and some really big writers. If you don't know mystery genre, those guys are really big. I'm super lucky to get in that and, and grateful. And Roger Corman, somebody in their office, read it, and they emailed me and said, hey, how'd you like to write a script? And, and I did. So, um, and, and you know what, That's, I think that happens more than we think. And I, I don't, I'm not saying you're going to get lucky like that, but what I'm saying is that there are different avenues to get into the business. Everybody wants to know how to get into the business, because you want to do the same thing. So you can, there's so many different ways. It could be a chance encounter at a Comic-Con. It could be, you know, a story that you wrote that somebody really liked and wanted to make it into, into the film. You know, I have lots of low-budget producers approached me wanting to turn my short stories into films I and mean, they just didn't have the you know budget or they, they weren't really very reputable so I didn't go with it. But it's just, you know, there's lots of different um, avenues. I don't have an agent. Um, I'm gonna I'm writing a spec script right now and I'm gonna write it a little bit bigger and I, and I probably will seek out an agent in that case. But yeah, that's there's a few guys that work in a low budget that don't have an agent. Yes? When uh, Roger Corman called you and said I got a script He did that. That's, he was embarrassed to tell me. That's right. First of all, sci-fi sci -fi came up with shark -tipos. Um Roger wanted to call it Octoshark. Because um, he thought that was more menacing sounding. He thought shark -tipos sounds silly. And, and I, I, I never disagree with Roger. That's, that's a good rule. This guy has so much experience and knows what he's doing. Um, so you never disagree with Roger, but I kind of thought shark -tipos was a better title. Um, he, he relented finally to the sci-fi and made Sharks Post. He, but he was almost embarrassed talking to me. He was like, this crazy idea that they have putting a shark octopus together and they want me to do it and they'd like you to write the script. And I was totally on board. It was just cheesy and fun. And, um, yeah, that's, that's the story. Yeah, he, he, he was kind of, it was funny. He was, he was kind of embarrassed to tell me that. Wouldn't Octo Shark have eight heads? <laughs> I really. I wanted to give it the the yeah. head of a, an octopus and the tail of a shark. They didn't go for it. <laughs> they didn't think that would work. But anybody else? How are we doing on time? Six minutes. Six minutes. Yes? Um, do you have any good script software that you use? Or? Uh, script software? Final Draft is kind of the accepted norm. I'm sure there's plenty of others, but Final Draft, the problem is it's expensive. I'm, I'm using an old, outdated one, but, and I probably should, you know, pay to, to get a new one. But yeah, that's 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 one that I use. I know there's others out there. Um, I know a lot of people use Final Draft. Did you have a comment on that? Or? Yeah, um, I use Springer because it's forty bucks. So it's yeah, it does almost everything that it does. Do you know a lot of people that have that in the industry? I don't use Celtech, which is free. So 
Okay. Yeah, the, the only problem with using, and, and I don't know, I'm gonna plead ignorance on this. The only problem with using different programs, if you send them your script and they don't have that program, they can't read it, and then they gotta download it. You don't wanna put any barriers. So from what I've heard, I mean, maybe, maybe a lot of people have that program too. You can export it as Final Draft too. Oh, you can, okay. On a, on a PDF. PDF. But then, yeah. Some of the local libraries also have Final Draft machines, the ones that have maker spaces and uh, media centers. The librarian doesn't show those plug, but there's just a lot of the library systems that are saying there's nothing that have the professional software on their computers. Yeah, Final Draft is also fun in these days, but it is expensive. I think it was, I, I'm sure it's a lot cheaper now. I bought it so many years ago, I think we really need to update, but it's like $300. It's never going to be cheap. Uh, yeah. Motion yeah. Magic, too. So, uh, how, how much is it now? Yeah. I went to, I had an update recently to be compatible with uh, something that, uh, a And that was upgrade price. Yeah. It was an upgrade price, yeah. So and we can write in Caltex and bring it to your library and you can convert it to Final Draft yeah, for us? Nice. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of work. Yes. I'm a teacher too. How do you manage your time? <laughs> I don't do it very well. <laughs> it's, it's tough. It is. Um, you know, uh, it's, it, and I'm not, I put the work in, I do. When, when I'm on, on deadline, my butt is in the seat, and I, you make your deadlines. That's, that's another piece of advice. Always, 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 always make your deadlines. If you want another job, make your deadline, no matter what. Okay? If you get a deadline, you gotta make it. Um, it's tough, you know, you work nights and weekends when the kid goes to bed. You gotta, you gotta get the family time in there, too, though. And it's just, you, I'm a very tired person. No, and it's true. I sleep five hours a night, six hours a night at the most, and then I work at school for eight hours a day. Home and I spend some time with the family, and then it's back in the back office typing away. Um, and you can burn out too, so you got to take some breaks. Um, I find it's, you know, it's, yeah, you just got to, I, I think everybody's different, but maybe schedule it, and that so, sounds so inorganic, but you got to schedule the time because I always made sure that even though I was doing scripts, that I would put my daughter down and, and, and read a story with her. Because I don't want to be that dad who's always in the room. Because you hear, you hear, oh, daddy's working, you'll go back there and you're like, oh, I'm that dad. But yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's a great question. I, I wish I had a better answer. You just, you just got to make, you got to hammer out. And usually that means less sleep. I got these bags for a reason. I'm 22. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you put into outlining before you begin writing? That is a great question. Um, on the movies that I had up on the screen, very little. <laughs> it, it really depends on, on, on those that I was hired to do. Some of them, it's like you need them really quick. Like Dinocar vs. Super Gator, I didn't. I co-wrote that, and they needed it fast. Uh, there was no time for outline, no time for research. That doesn't show in the film, right? No, no time for any of that. So you got to you got to jump in there and do it. And and the same is true for the other ones. So not a ton of outline. You write up a, a synopsis usually that's anywhere from like you, Roger would have me write up like a ten-page synopsis, and then I would do the first. Sometimes I'd do the first half of the script, and then we take a look, and then send it back with changes while I was writing. They would look at it while I was working on the second half, and that's uh, that's tough because. Many of you that have written scripts, if you make one little change to a scene and it could be super small, it's like dominoes. It changes your whole script. So, um, yeah, not a lot of, lot of outlining now on my own time, a ton of outlining. Um, I'm, I'm outlining probably too much and writing little cards and doing all that. Um, Save the Cat does a whole, that book that I showed you does a whole advice on outlining that I think is really good and how to, how to write the cards. But you gotta find what works for you. I mean, the, the, you have to find what works for you. So it depends on the project. Yes? So for Shark Tank, for example, did you just get the title of the movie and they told you to go from there? Or did they give you any direction? Before? Yeah, Roger gave me some preliminary directions. He said it's Shark Plus and it was created by this company for the Navy. You know, and then we have it gets loose, and they have to get back. And then, then I was off to the races. 
And really, that was, that was pretty much it. And then from that, I write a synopsis, and then he does this, and then the sci-fi said, nope, we, want it, we don't want it to start in Mexico. Roger wanted to shoot in Mexico because it was cheaper and, and he knew people that could produce it there. Sci-fi wanted to start it, and was very adamant for some reason, starting in California. For whatever reason, they might have any, and you know, a lot of people give sci-fi a bad rap with these things, but they are very analytical with what you see on the scripts. Um, when you're writing a creature feature, really weird things like they want it all in the daytime because low budget films, the night shooting isn't that great. So natural lighting, so they don't want scenes during the night. They want to try to, and, and they have very particular rules because they found that they can tell when people change the channel. So that's why they came up with the idea of making sure it's a, an action piece after every break. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the time that we have. So thank you very much, Mike. Thank you guys. We really appreciate it. We do need to clear the room, so if you'd like to have a conversation, you will be outside.